Tonight, we're looking at the science behind the news in our next instalment of the Science Behind the Headlines, supported by Inspiring Australia, uh, the Sci Australian Science Media Centre, and of course, RIOS. Uh, remember that tonight, we are live streaming this particular event, so uh, you will actually be able to follow on the discussion, whether you are in the audience here, or if you're at home, by following Twitter or the chat room. If you are going to use Twitter, please use the hashtags RIOS and Drugs in Sport. Tonight, we're discussing the science behind the recent revelations of drug taking that now seems to be endemic across all sports. In January this year, Lance Armstrong sat down with Oprah Winfrey, and in five yeses, he admitted to cheating, doping, lying, bullying, and fraud. His confession con uh, cast shockwaves through cycling, then sport more generally, with accusations of doping uh, uh, in other sports starting to trickle forth. In February this year, the Australian Crime Commission released a report into Australian sport, indicating, among other things, that drug taking was taking place in Australian sport and by Australian athletes. This controversy is the biggest shake-up in sport in Australia since the introduction of one-day cricket. Both AFL and NRL leagues are reeling from the publicity uh, of their highly suspicious supplement regimes that have prompted some teams to go into damage control. Essendon Football Club has sacked its sports scientists and the Cronulla Sharks have sacked everyone, including the coach, although he's subsequently been rehired. Tonight, we ask, what are the athletes taking? What are the effects? And what can be done to stop it? Further, what are we testing for and how are we doing it? Finally, and perhaps most controversially, why is taking a pill considered cheating at all? All big questions to consider, and to help me to do that tonight, I'd like to introduce my panel, uh, Doctor of Exercise Physiology and Head of the School of Human Movement Studies at Charles Sturt University, Professor Robert Robergs, the registered... Uh, resi uh, Registered physiologist, psychologist, uh, psychologist. Oh. Yeah, well, physiologist is a little bit easier to say, but I'll go with psychologist. <laughs> Registered psychologist, senior lecturer at the University of New South Wales and editor-in-chief of the scientific journal Performance Enhancement and Health, Dr. Jason Mazanoff, and uh, from the, uh, a media officer from the Australian Science Media Centre, Annika Dean. Would you please give my panel a big round of applause? <laughs> Um, okay, uh, so uh, also be aware that those of you in the audience here, as you're watching these clips, there will be some blank spots in clips where we couldn't get licensing for those particular shots of these clips. Without further ado, I'd like to play the first of those clips so you can see what I mean. This is an interview with Tyler Hamilton and Lee Sales from the 7.30 report. Please cl play clip one. Let's start with, uh, let's go back to Oprah Winfrey's interview with Lance Armstrong. And in both cases, these athletes had been taking EPO, testosterone, and had been do uh, blood doping. So, Robert, what were they doing? What is EPO? What is the <coughs> testosterone? What is blood doping? Well, let, let's just start, let's just go back just one step, right? If, you, if you're an elite athlete and you're involved in a contact sport or you're involved in a sport that's kind of clocked by distance or speed, you know, power is everything. And for an athlete, power is how rapidly you can generate force by your contracting muscles. So we can look at sport and athletes in the context that, well, if you're looking at very explosive type activities, like in our contact sports, they're looking at muscle bulk connected to power. If you're doing an endurance-related sport, you're looking at the ability of muscles to generate power repeatedly over time for, for long periods of time. So if you're looking at the, the, the muscle size connection, you're, you're talking about anabolic agents, which is the testosterone and the growth hormone. And now today we have analogs that improve the body's response to a given amount of endogenous or within the body um, anabolic steroid or growth hormone. Um, we're talking about certain anabolic agents that can now actually mimic some of these hormones. And that was released by the ACC report. On the endurance side, 
EPO is the abbreviation for erythropoietin. It's a hormone synthesized in the kidney by specialized cells. Its, its role is to actually stimulate increased red blood cell production. It's very potent, it's potentially dangerous, and there have been athletes who have died over the years for abusing EPO. Now, blood doping has been around for 30, 40 years. Um, it's been well known in the cycling fraternity. It's where an athlete has blood removed from their body anywhere from half a litre to a litre. And then several weeks later, once the body's recovered from that blood loss and they have normal blood volume again and normal red blood cell mass, part of that removed blood is reinfused back into the body and it raises red blood cell um, content um, and the ability to transport oxygen uh, to the working muscles. And that enables them to have more power for prolonged periods of time. So, and they're all very, very effective, as has been established by, by research. I, I also heard that with blood doping, you can use um, parts of calves' blood. Is this true? Well, can we go trans species here? And I guess there's been some rumours and some evidence that yes, some rugby league players have been doing that. Um, I'm, that that hasn't been really researched, but certainly there's some evidence that yeah, there are some components of animal blood that can also provide some benefit on the anabolic side. All right. So, um, Jason, would you say that the, there is definitely a benefit of taking these things? I mean, they are all normal parts of the human body, aren't they? The question about whether or not performance-enhancing drugs are actually performance-enhancing is actually a lot more vexed than we think. So if, for example, look at the fine specimen you have here of an athlete. As an athlete, I might get a great academic. Um, if you load me up on human growth hormone and anabolic steroids, I'm not going to go and win a medal. Okay? We have to remember that, that it is not the be-all and end-all of performance. There's a paper which came out in the International Journal of Drug Policy just yesterday, which is a linear regression about what effect has doping had on the times in the 100 metres final of the Olympics, the men's final, the famous 1988 race being the starting point. And there is absolutely no effect for doping. They haven't been able to find one. Now, there could be sampling problems in there, and they, they note that. But what they've shown is that the change in, in running time over the period in question is as would be expected, irrespective of whether you introduce anti-doping laws or anything, which either means that the drugs were already there or that they're actually having no effect. And the conclusion that they draw is that the drugs that are being used for the 100 metres final in the Olympics don't actually have an ergogenic effect. So, well, if that's the case, why are they be t being taken? Look, as a psychologist, I'd love to say that it's because athletes feel that they need to. There's no question that, that these drugs do have some kind of impact. If you think about the tour, it's an incredibly long race. And if you get a really minute percentage increase over that entire race, 1% could be 30 kilometres. So they do have some effect. It's just not as big as we might think it is. But when you're talking about elite sport, the margins are so small that even those tiny margins can make a big difference. I've got a comment there. So, so anybody who was watching Lance Armstrong, though, during his reign in the Tour de France, um, most exercise physiologists would have said, this is just unbelievable. So when, when you get elite athletes and you take them up and have them compete against each other, the physiology doesn't explain performance, right? Things like psychology does, um, perhaps their recovery interval, other, other aspects can really better explain performance between elite athletes. But then when you get... <laughs> Lance and being all that he was on, there were, there were times in the races, and I remember vividly the, the time when he got thrown off his bike by his handlebar hooking onto a handbag or something, and he got left behind and he just powered up, and to have that degree of separation at the elite end of an athlete's scale just speaks of supplementation. So um, you were on to Lance years ago, were you, I, I was I was quietly telling my students that this is too good to be true. Um, but I was just amazed how little conversation was going on at that time for how the physiology difference that was there um, was so stark but not really um, talked about. Um, Probably because no one wanted to believe it. Yeah, so mean, many people were taken aback by what Lance did. And they well, it basically, was a dream, wasn't it? It was a dream know, that this from superhero cancer. of a man yeah. could win seven Tour de France's and then to come out and say, well, actually, it wasn't me, it was drugs, shattered yeah. a lot of people. They yeah. lost a hero. Yeah. Now, upstairs in the uh, Australian Science Media Centre, I mean, your mm -hmm. main role is to connect scientists to journalists, journalists to scientists. Uh, when the whole uh, 
the, the crime commission report came out uh, about blood doping and uh, and the Lance Armstrong thing blew up uh, at the beginning of the year or as late last year how did it affect you guys did was there much traffic was, was anybody interested in for Lance no and I basically because by then it was more about the man it wasn't the drugs it wasn't what he'd done it was it was him it was you know the Oprah interview and you know we all sat up there with amazement of, of all his responses and his admissions but there wasn't really science at that stage like there were no questions everyone wanted to know what he'd been doing but they didn't want to know what that was exactly it was more about had he done it is he going to admit it and in the process who would he hurt doing it so for in January we um you know during the Oprah interview and things like that we didn't get anything basically um and then but for the AEC report we got um we reacted to it we hadn't had uh, very many questions about it but we thought well Maybe we should be putting ourselves out there and, and just setting a few of the records straight because there are a few issues about there about the use of you know peptides and and those things sort of arose. So we felt we had to jump in then, um, and that wasn't on the back of anyone asking us, but we figured it was probably important that we how, got a few people out there. How do um, athletes take these drugs? Let's take EPO, testosterone. They're just straight injections. Yeah, that's, that's the favoured avenue, um, venous or intramuscular injections. Yes. Uh, blood doping, of course, that would be a cannula, would it? Yeah, and a, through and a, a drip bottle. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, what, because these things are normal things, parts of the, body, uh, of, of, of the human system, um, what's the detection regime? Well, How do you detect it? Well, in the, in the good old days, 30 or more years ago, the for example, the testosterone growth hormone analogs were from animals, so they differed structurally to the human type, so they are relatively easier to detect. So, so nowadays, with these anabolic peptides that are out there, it's a, it's a bit more difficult, although they're different than what's really occurring in the human body. Um, so they can be de detected that way. And then there's the response, but the response is then, um, so if you're looking at muscle bulk, or if you're looking at erythropoietin, if you're looking at red blood cell mass, like hematocrit, like Tyler was talking about, um, they look for, for out of range values, but with normal human variation that adds uncertainty. So you can have someone probably taking these things, but if they start off on the low end, that puts them up on the high end, but it can be acceptable. So um, you'd actually, I imagine it would be more of a problem with things like testosterone. You'd need to track someone over time to see if their system elevates in testosterone. Yeah, so... And they're not just naturally endowed with a large yeah. testosterone output. Well, that's right. So these modulators that are out now, for example, that really improve the body's response and secretion of some of these hormones, um, you probably have to look for these modulators. But see, in, in human biochemistry, these molecules have what's called a half-life. So the, the body metabolizes and breaks these down. And so there's only a certain time frame where you can really more confidently look at whether or not these substances have, have been taken. The, that, that breakdown time, uh, Hamil uh, Tyler Hamilton referred to them as glow times, mm -hmm. and uh, apparently he said that he wouldn't have been able to have got through hundreds of drug tests if he didn't have a good team of scientists telling him when he was glowing and when he was clean, yep. and, and that they would actually manage his drug, can you talk to us a bit? I mean, how does, how does that work? You can actually manage someone's drug regime so yeah. around the testing? Well, we, we can't talk a lot about it. One, as researchers, we're not allowed to research this stuff because it's unethical, actually, the researchers. So we know a lot about it based upon the people who do. And then in terms of the time frames, that's that's a bit of a problem being a researcher not allowed to research the subject you're researching. Well, that, that happens <laughs> a lot though, doesn't it, in, in science and depending upon what topic you're looking at. But anyway, so we have to look at the athletes who do it and try and search them out and then try and, and ascertain um, some of these details. But you know, WADA doesn't like to give out a lot of information. I mean, a lot of their stuff is pretty secret. They don't want to let people know about these time frames, and so the people who might be taking it and abusing it, find out from trial and error and who gets caught and therefore that window was a little too long or too narrow. Um, so, but they're very, they're very much substance specific and certainly that you're right, it's a well established, well rehearsed, um, pretty well orchestrated series of events that the, these athletes get exposed to. Jason, two questions, you can choose which one you'd like to answer. Um, how would you go about detecting drugs in a sportsman or if you were their coach, how would you go about making it so that they're not detected? Hmm, good questions. <laughs> um, what was the first one again? 
Well, <laughs> how would you detect, uh, what, what regime would you put in place to try and catch drug cheats in sport? Yeah, look, my, my answer to this is going to be horrendously obtuse. Um, the problem is that high performance managers, I guess, you've got a drug regime for athletes at the elite level. And the question becomes legality and illegality, which can change. Caffeine used to be banned, now it's not. Um, so the question then becomes, as a high performance manager of sport, my question is, how do I risk manage this issue? It's not, oh, you know, oh, can't do that because it's bad, no. If I look at this in terms of pure business, I have to think about what other teams might be doing and then how do I respond to that? Now, do I think they're going to get caught? If I think they're going to get caught, then I should probably stay clean because then I'll be the victor because they'll be taken out of the competition. So when you talk about as, as a manager, it's actually a very different question because they're going to be looking at, and we've seen it with Essendon and, and the claims now that are coming out, they want to sail close to the wind because that's where performance advantage lies. That's where competitive advantage lies. Sport is business at this end of the market, okay? It's not this romanticised, Hellenic, idealised, you know, people are doing it for virtuous reasons and noble reasons. That's bollocks. It's complete big business up there. Now, they're going to do what they need to do to make sure that their sport is more attractive, it's faster, it's stronger than another sport. Now, when you look at, say, the AFL competing with the NRL, how do they get market share? We have to make our, our, our game better and harder and faster. When you do that, you put pressure on the athletes. They're the people who have to go in week out, week in, week out, and produce. They have very little time to recover. They've got to start looking at, well, how do I get back on the field? So professional cyclists, for example, if I'm not on the bike, if I'm not racing, I'm not getting money. So I've got to get back on the bike as fast as I can. I was talking to a guy in Melbourne about this problem. And his body broke because he was trying to maintain a training regime to be competitive with other cyclists, some of whom were doping, and he just couldn't do it. So if you ask me then, how do I try and drug-proof a team, my answers start coming back as fundamentally alter sport. Actually start looking at how you structure sport so that athletes don't have to take drugs to survive. So things like have shorter seasons, don't have as intense events, have more time between intense events if you want to run them. So don't force, for example, our swimmers to go from event to event to event in the lead up to the World Championships. Maybe have them have fewer events, then when they get to the World Champs, give them a good couple of months off. Let them recover. I mean, you see the guys who come off the Tour de France, I mean, they're, they're broken people. They're really, you know, give them the time off. Let them come back naturally so they don't need to use EPO, anabolic steroids and so on, to help that recovery period. There's a much more far-reaching uh, uh, answer than I was expecting. <laughs> I feel like Sorry. I asked at a time and found out how the watch was made, but that's very interesting. <laughs> um, let's, let's move along to our next clip. Uh, this is Stephen Dank, for, former Essendon sports scientist, uh, after being asked about the nature of supplement programs that he'd brought into the AFL. This is what Stephen Dank had to say. But, but that speaks directly to what you were just saying, that, you, that the pressures in sport are so much these days that it's not a case of managing the drugs, it's managing the sport that needs to be addressed. That's, that, that's big, but like the guys in, uh, at Essendon, what were they taking? That, that wasn't uh, EPO and, and testosterone, that was vitamins and peptides. Well, first of all, the ACC report is a intelligence exercise. We don't know the facts yet. They're still not released. Um, but, but if you listen to that full interview, there's supposition that um, they were anabolic peptides, some other byproducts of animal blood, um, and then certainly vitamin B supplementation. Um, and that's kind of... I mean, uh, the, the main address verbally has been, oh, it's mainly vitamins, but the supposition that there's, there's other things involved. It's just really hard to comment too much on this without more evidence, and Asada's job now is to get to that evidence and then release it, which I think we're all agreeing is becoming a very slow, drawn-out uh, task right now. Um, so, yeah, it's unclear. We still don't know exactly what it was, but... I thought it was a masterful piece of media management, the way that it was dealt with, because, you know, 
following on from what you're saying, a, a large part of this is driven by the whole gambling thing, uh, industry that sprung up around sport. And so what do they do? They have a report they release, they say, uh, what was it, six teams in the NRL uh, are suspected, we're not going to tell you which ones. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't mind opening a book as to which six clubs they were, and that way we could make some money on the side. <laughs> That's, uh, and, uh, but coming back to a point that you made earlier about um, managing what other people are doing, Lance Armstrong said something very interesting, uh, that at the time, when, when Oprah asked him if taking banned substances was cheating, he said, at the time, no. The definition of cheating is to gain an advantage on a rival or foe that they don't have. I didn't view it that way. I viewed it, and in this case he was talking about doping, as creating a level playing field. That's a masterful piece of uh, mental arithmetic to be I, able to... I hope he's not teaching all his kids that two wrongs make a right. Would, but <laughs> but that, that plays on from what you were saying about what what is everybody else doing? What is a competitive advantage. I, I've, um, I've put this up uh, in some of the stuff I do online. Um, who, we haven't actually gone through and actually analysed the tours in question. They just didn't do it. Now, this is where I start being suspicious. This was about Lance. I mean, the French have had an in for Armstrong for a long time, and goodness knows that Travis Tiggett and Lance Armstrong, so Travis Tiggett being the head of the US anti-doping agency, they really don't like each other, um, as you can tell by some of the, the flying lawsuits they've threatened at each other. This was about Lance. This was not necessarily about doping and cycling. Um, if they were serious about it, they would go through and they would analyse all of those samples. They would go back and they would do the same non-analytic investigative job and they would find the first clean winner. Now, I wonder the legitimacy of that if the first clean winner was the 87th placed cyclist. <laughs> Okay, so when we talk about the level playing field, I mean, this notion that sport is somehow about being fair is naive. It really is. Sport is a discriminatory activity, just like education, okay? We are there to sort out the winners from the losers and the best people from the people who probably should do something else. So when it comes to this, I mean, you know, you had Eddie the Eel from Equatorial Guinea came out uh, in the 2000 Olympics. And the guy had never seen an Olympic swimming pool before. How is that fair compared to well, the Germans or the Australians? <laughs> and that's the question. What's entertaining? I think this is really, the, this is it. Sport has gone from being this wonderful Victorian pastime of gentlemanly honour, preparing them to take over the natives and whatever colonial outpost we're talking about. And um, it's moved into this thing of like, it's not about fair, it's all about what you can produce so that people will watch it. You can sell advertising space, sponsorship. That's the important thing. The, yeah, I was amazed at that comment, more from what didn't happen after it than really what it was about, because sport is, is never based on a level playing field. I mean, the whole idea of competitive sport is to generate as unlevel a playing field as you can, whether it be by better training or better recruitment, better approaching your true salary cap, or in some teams, actually exceeding your salary cap. Um, and to do that in whatever way possible, then there's this, this line that's drawn by some external agency, you know, WADA, that says, oh no, that's now unethical. Okay, now that's okay. So the issue is about ethics, and somehow or other, and it's a bit of a mystery, we have to decide what becomes unethical. And that's, that's really the grey zone, because mm -hmm. there, there are many arguments you could make for some of the things going on that now, as was well explained by, by Jason, I mean, a player's health is also really, really important. And I'm amazed at how little power a player has to protect him or herself in today's sporting arena. Let's, yeah. uh, let's bring up our next um, uh, uh, clip which is, we're going back here to uh, Tyler Hamilton. This is his take on the whole question of the efficacy of cheating. The phrase, I saw him dope in nine, does that mean he saw the needle going in the, I mean, when he said I saw him doping, what was he <coughs> physically seeing at the time? Well, probably. I mean, we don't know. Um, in, in these Tour de France cyclists, to, to dope effectively and to minimise the risk, because let's not forget, this is a strategy that is potentially life-threatening if done wrong. 
So you need a, a big, well-funded system with highly skilled and trained personnel, which would mean medically trained, to assist in this. And so, you know, let your mind wander. I mean, would there be caravans full of IV tubes and, and this or that? And I would probably say yes. I mean, um, one of the other issues with these athletes is the dehydration, and they would have to be put on intravenous saline or fluid to be able to race the way they race the next day because it can take the body two or three days to get over severe dehydration, and these athletes are doing it day after day after day. So um, you let your mind wander. I mean, it's, it's, it would be very, very easy to walk through a caravan perhaps and see, yeah, medical... And a saline medical. drip isn't considered uh, cheating or an unfair advantage? <laughs> Apparently by water, my understanding is no. Annika, does it worry you that these guys can actually rationalise away cheating quite so... They, they seem to do it quite Only easily. a little bit. I'm a big sports person. I play it and I watch it and... And, I've, and especially the AFL stuff, which is, I'm, I'm a big Crows fan and we'll, we'll ignore last Friday's game. But um, and just the idea that sport, it's almost like sport can't be fixed because the idea that it's an, an uneven playing field plays to the fact that you play to win. And unless you aren't playing to win, you're not playing sport, you're not playing a game. And that's, the, that's almost the only way you could level it out is to take away. Oh, that hang they, on. Playing to win? Is that really all sport is about? And if, if it is, then you just justify doping. Th well, that's what I rules. mean. Like, there if, are rules. If, they, if there are rules, and, but as you say, if they don't win, they don't get money. Like the problem with the, the lower end of the AFL sporting teams is people like the, the teams like Port Adelaide have so much trouble, except not of late, now they have a new sponsor, because they're not performing well enough. So there is obviously that element that unless they perform, they don't get money, they can't is, survive, so they need the drugs true? to perform. Is that true of the under-12 netball team? Well, hopefully they're not <laughs> taking no, drugs. But, but here it is. I mean, you're talking about sport has to be about winning, except when it doesn't, which is junior sport when it's supposed to be character development and so on. So, I mean, let's clarify. what is there a difference between elite sport and non-elite sport that means we actually have to have different rules? And at the moment, anti-doping is only applied at the elite level. There is bugger all that happens anywhere else. Now, if this was actually a big public health issue... Let's take it down to the bottom end. And the, the Cycling Australia review by Justice Woods says, look, the elite level, whatever, let's get into club cycling. Let's get into where it actually matters down the bottom. This, I'm on a rant now. <laughs> Continue on. Stop <laughs> calling it cheating, OK? The, it really annoys me when people say, they're drug cheats. It's sensationalising an issue and it, it avoids the main issue. We are talking about people who feel that they have to take drugs to do their job. Okay? To call them cheats is to somehow say that, okay, look, these people are wrong. You're demonising. This is what happened to Lance Armstrong. We smashed him because we put him up on a moral pedestal and then we were disappointed to find out that what we demanded he do as consumers, all of a sudden the, the veil comes back and we go, holy crap, that's what you have to do to win the tour? Man, now that, that to me, we've got to start looking at it and saying this is more than just about who wins. It's interesting that we didn't uh, smash Lance Armstrong for t uh, going through chemotherapy in order to beat cancer, but for taking drugs in a different setting, that's when it becomes problematic. And am I actually reading you right that perhaps we should take the attitude of drugs in sport should be allowed, providing they're properly regulated and managed? My position was, is and always has been that drugs need to be controlled in sport. I reject the laissez-faire, and this is the problem with the whole debate I, as someone who comes out and says, I disagree with anti-doping, and then I get blackballed by pretty much everyone up and down the food chain as someone who is for drugs. I am for letting everyone use everything. Now, the question that I, when I sat down, had a good, long, hard look at myself, and I had a look at my infant son, and I said, do I want him to grow up in a system where he has to use drugs? No, and I hope to God that he doesn't show any promise as an elite athlete. <laughs> but if he does, I'm incredibly well equipped to manage that process now. And if he's going to have to use drugs to get through his career and come out at the end of it being able to walk, not having his brain smashed in through multiple concussions, I want him to use those drugs. And I want him to use those drugs in a way which is going to mean that he has a sustained, healthy life for a normal lifespan. I've got to say, Lance Armstrong, Tyler Hamilton, they don't look like sick men to me. I hope I look that good when I'm their age. 
it, but, it, 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 it's a question of context too, isn't it? Because uh, you know, if your son was to go into rock and roll, uh, I mean, Keith Richards, where would he be without drugs? <laughs> yeah, but he uh, doesn't look as good as Lance Armstrong. <laughs> yeah, and but, what would happen to the rave scene? I mean, really? Yeah, yeah but, but hang on, let's, let's go to the other side of that. So, you know, there are many exercise physiologists who are fascinated by pushing uh, human performance limits. Okay, so if, if, we, if we do that, and we say, let's really try and, and make men and women perform to their extreme best, that in and of itself adds to the risk of the competition. So if you get bigger and bigger and bigger men playing rugby league football, it becomes a more dangerous and more dangerous and more dangerous arena. And you can apply that to whatever dimension of sport you want, you want to look at. If you make cyclists cycle faster, momentum is physics if they crash they're going to get hurt more severely. So, you know, there, come, we, we just, there, there comes a reason, and it's complex. I mean, I don't have the answer. I mean, Jason <laughs> seems to think he has an answer. I don't have an answer, but it's just that if you push the limits, it gets more dangerous. Um, so you're, you, you wouldn't necessarily uh, follow Jason's advice? Well, I think Jason's earlier advice was, was the key issue, but it, it, it butts up with money. I mean, we need to manage sport so that the athletes considered more. And if adding more games to a season in a football code or if adding more consecutive days of competing in any other event is more and more risky and demands that they do have to take supplements to survive, finish, maybe a better word, that event, then that's just, like Jason said, it's pushing them to have to do it. So that sports management in a world now where sports is dollars and Olympics is dollars and when we always look at how many gold medals this country got versus another country after the Olympics. And like in Australia, we just complain to heck about our swimmers for not getting as many gold medals. I mean, come on, it's, it's really an endemic situation. And I mean, Jason hit it on the head. I mean, how are we going to regulate sport to be protected from that? It's just complex. It's hard. Lively and exciting discussions, ladies and gentlemen. It is time to go to the intermission. In fact, I'm getting a hurry up note because I've already run over time. We're going to take a brief 10 minute, in fact, no, we'll take a full 10 minute uh, intermission. Um, uh, but before we do that, could you please give a big round of applause to our three speakers this evening?